at him. Does this goat skin make me look big? Looks better on you than the previous owner. What? I'm having a hard time losing these last few pounds and sparing your children, and that's the best you can do? I look better than a goat? Thanks. Babe, you know you are the most beautiful woman on the planet. Hmm. What? I'm the only woman on the planet. Well, I can't help that. You know, and it's amazing that as the only woman on the planet, you still can't seem to remember my birthday or give me flowers once in a while. Well, I did give you a rib. Oh, right. I forgot about that since you haven't mentioned it for an hour. It's like your free pass to never lift a finger for me again. Never lift a finger? I am out there busting my rear all day. Food just doesn't pop up from the ground. I have to get it with the sweat of my brow. Since someone went and got the ground cursed. You think farming's hard? Try raising those kids. Try giving birth. Well, if someone wouldn't have taken advice from a talking reptile. Oh, here we go. Are you talking to me, you little snake? What? Oh, jump off a bridge? Oh, I would, but they haven't been invented yet. Oh, eat this fruit? Well, you look like a pretty trustworthy snake. Nobody's perfect. Yeah, well, we were until you went and pretty much ruined it for all of mankind, so good job with that. I seem to remember you taking a bite, too. Well, I thought I was eating from the tree of the knowledge of restfulness and serenity. Right. It's never your fault. Besides, what was I going to do with a fallen wife? That would just be weird. Oh, you fell for me? You're an idiot. Idiot? I named every single animal. Right. Great job with that. A, a prairie dog's not a dog, a seahorse isn't a horse, and a bald eagle isn't bald. Well, I was going pretty fast. Aardvark? Platypus? Okay, they were at the back of the line. Not everything can be cat or rat or bat. Hippopotamus? Yeah, well, woman was taken. Okay, how many gorge do you have back there? That was a joke. Not good for men to be alone. <sighs> no, it's great. Good morning, Mountain Movers Church. Uh, good morning to our newcomers. And we want to say good morning to those of you that might be watching online today. What a great day. It's been so beautiful outside. So nice. Have you guys enjoy the weather? Yes. Man, it's been nice. So we're really excited to have you guys here today. Uh, just a few housekeeping items. We want to welcome you, if you are a newcomer, especially to Wednesday nights here at Mountain Movers Church. It's nothing like Sunday mornings, but it's just as equally awesome as Wednesday nights because we get a chance to get to know you. Misty and I have a newcomer's life group, and um, so that is an opportunity for you to come and get to know us. We get to know you, and we just have a really good time together. But this Wednesday night in particular, we're going to do something a little bit different. Everybody say different. Different. That was horrible. All right. Everybody say different. Different. There you go. All right. So, so what this is, is, is it's our Connect night, okay? And so what we do during Connect is all of the adults come together and we just basically have a big party, right? And we take this opportunity to get to know one another. How many of you guys know it's really important that we build awesome relationships in the church, right? Connect and grow. That's what Wednesday nights are all about. So you're going to have an opportunity to hear about the upcoming life groups, uh, Bible studies, if you will, on Wednesday nights. You'll get to meet the life group leaders and hear kind of their vision and what they do. And then you're going to also kind of find out what it means to serve here. And you're going to hear all about all the great opportunities uh, that comes with, with being a part of this family. So it's really exciting. That's right. And on Connect Night, not only do the adults get to connect, but so do the, the kids. kids connect as well. So maybe you've been coming for a while, and maybe you are a kid that's 12 and under, and maybe you haven't really made friends yet. Connect is all about helping you to do that. So we purposely, the leaders, put together a night where you can learn to make friends. And if you're a teenager and you've been coming to Accelerate, um, Accelerate is awesome. Accelerate is awesome. This last week, you know what they did? And I only know because I spy on them through their Facebook page because I'm a pastor, so I get to be on their Facebook page even though I don't think they know I'm there. But this week, that's kind of creepy. Week, it is kind of creepy. I rarely, every once in a while, I respond and think, "Oh, I don't want them to know that I'm watching them." Ooh, they know I'm here. Okay. But anyway, last Wednesday night, apparently, Lacey, their leader, she gave them a challenge, and she said, "Every day, I want you to take a sticky note." I'm assuming I'm only gathering this because I'm a spy, right? She said. Write down one word that describes how what God means.
talking yeah. to you today, put a scripture with it, snap a picture of your sticky note, and post it for the whole world to see and encourage the rest of the teenagers. And it was awesome. Like, I saw all kinds of sticky notes and cool words like provider and wow. healer awesome. and all of these awesome words, and it was coming from our teenagers. I was so proud. Give our yeah. teenagers But man, I'm really proud of Accelerate. So if you have a teenager, and if you're not coming, She's doing awesome if you haven't been coming on Wednesday night, it's one hour, seven to eight. You need your kids, you need your teens, and you as adults need to be a part of Wednesday night. It's awesome. Yes. All right, well, let's get into today's series. Man, we are in part three of an awesome series called Love Out Loud. And it is kind of the Valentine month, so it's just kind of the natural month to talk about love, right? So this morning... We're going to be talking about marriage, and we probably tipped it off by that funny commercial. But the funny thing is, that's kind of, that's kind of real life. It's kind of real I mean, maybe you didn't go shopping for a mattress and that's the only actually way to jump in the bed. But you know what's weird? Brad and I need a new mattress. And so I've been trying to figure out, I told him, I'm like, how do you go buy a mattress? And you spend a lot of money, right? But unless you actually fall asleep and wake up on you it, you're never going to know. You don't know. I'm inspired. I am too. But here's the deal. The only way they were going to know if it really worked is if it was natural. So obviously what was natural for that couple was yeah. to fight right before bed. <laughs> that was what was natural. I would totally, if I'm in a mattress store, I would totally let people test drive. Test drive. <laughs> the mattresses. <laughs> but I, maybe I can put a plastic cover on them so they don't get their skin. That's disgusting. Like their dead skin cells. Dead skin cells and bed. skin mites. Who wants it? Who wants it? That's nasty, man. There's bugs living in your pool. That's it! You know that? Nasty. I'm sorry, go ahead. That is, that is the APT Pastor Brad Mama right there. Well, you know what? Listen to me. If we go all the way back to the beginning of the book, you can just flip your Bible all the way back to Genesis if you have it. The beginning. The very beginning. You know, when you start in Genesis 1, the Bible says this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Then he goes through all the things that he created. And if you want to know what they are, just walk outside. Okay? Just open your eyes. People who say there's no God, I'm like, just open your eyes. Because I don't know how you can deny what incredible beauty we see every single day. But if you go on to about the third chapter, you see this incredible story of a wedding. Did you know the Bible starts with a wedding? God creates this guy named Adam. And Adam, Adam's side, he creates this woman named Eve. And God performs the very first wedding. And you know, it wasn't, it wasn't like today's wedding. There probably wasn't all the bells and whistles and all the thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands of dollars that are spent on a wedding. But nonetheless, there was a wedding. And there was a marriage in that chapter. And right after that wedding, happened. Do you know what we see? We see an enemy, Satan himself, comes into the picture. Satan comes into the picture. Do you know why? Because after we have marriage and after we have a wedding, in many, many homes, we have a war. After a wedding, we have a war. And maybe time will tell how long it is, but let me tell you why that begins to happen, okay? There's an enemy in this world who himself was kicked out of heaven. You can go and you can read that in Isaiah. But here's what happened. Satan himself was in heaven with God. And one day his pride got the best of him. And he said, you know what? I can do your job. Actually, I think I can do it better than you. So I think I need to be God. Well, God being God said, I don't think you know what you're talking about. Bye bye. Kicked him and two thirds of the angels out of heaven. Because of that moment, Satan hates God because he knows what his future holds. You can go to the back of the book and you can read about that. But see, Satan's already been defeated. But what happens in this earth realm that we live in, this earth cursed realm, because of Adam and Eve that day, because they gave in to the enemy's temptation and they sinned and sent into this world? Now there's an enemy that's prowling around in your homes trying to destroy your marriage and your families. It happens every single day. 
And if you want to know why, let me tell you why. Because a Christian marriage is the greatest example of the gospel message there is. And Satan knows it. Yeah, that's powerful. Think, think about that. Why does Satan attack so hard? Because when he knows that when two come together in union with Christ in the very center of their love for one another, they become so powerful. The Bible says that one person can send a thousand demons to fly, but two can send ten thousand. Imagine what two people madly in love with one another and in love with God can do for the glory of God, for the kingdom of God, the impact that they could make in this world. Satan knows. Listen, when you come to Christ, it's game time. War is on. When you get married, game time. War is on. Satan wants to bring down that marriage. Because... Let me just jump in right here. I'm just going to throw this out. Okay, We're going to talk about it a little bit later. The enemy is not your spouse. Yes. What begins to happen, once the enemy begins right. to attack in your homes, you lose, you lose all perspective, right? As the attack begins to happen, unless you have on supernatural spiritual eyes, you just think it's the other person. Because what you don't realize is that the enemy is going to work through your spouse to try to bring you down. Okay? So what you have to begin to realize is this, we, and we are married. We are not attacking one another. The enemy is the one that's trying to attack us. And if we don't together link up to fight this battle, we will be destroyed. Our marriage is, when, when a marriage is totally, completely Christ-centered, it's the evidence of His existence. So we're, we're like walking clues, right? That God exists. Because when people see a love that is so different, right? The world is not used to seeing people who are truly, completely, selflessly in love. They're not used to seeing it. They don't know what to do with it. So when they see it, it's like, okay, there's something unique. There's something different about these two. I can't quite, maybe they can't put their finger on it, but there's something different they recognize. Wow, I don't know what it is that they have in that relationship, but I want it. And I want to tell you that if you don't have that today, you can. Right? right? God wants to give that to you. He wants to bless your relationship. He wants to bless your marriage. Because especially, He wants to see His Spirit made known to mankind. But He wants to make it known through you as a couple. We are. This marriage is evidence of His existence. Powerful. So, when you think about, you know, this series is Love Out Loud. When you think about that phrase, love out loud, what do you think about? Right? I want you to just think in your mind, what does that look like to love out loud? And I think about, I think about action. You know? When I think about loving out loud, I think about action. You guys ever heard doing something? Have you guys ever heard the phrase, right? That action speaks louder than words, words right? And, and, you know, you can tell me all day long that you love me. And that's great. I appreciate that. It makes me feel cuddly and warm and soft. That's wonderful. Unless there's nothing backing it up. And then you lose that emotion. You lose the words. There's nothing there. Okay. So, but, what, but how powerful is it when you don't just tell somebody you love them, but you show them that you love them. Action speaks so much louder than words. What is the action, right, in your marriage look like? The love action, the loving out loud action look like in your marriage? And is anybody, can anybody see it? Is anybody recognizing, wow, there's something incredible, there's something tremendous about these people. Look at James 2 and 17. You wouldn't think about this in, in, a, in a message about marriage, but, but, but think about this. It says, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless, right? So what's the word teaching us? Faith without works is dead, right? Faith without works is dead. It's the same thing in our marriage, right? You can tell your spouse you love them all day long, but unless you show them, unless there's works that are following up and, and pushing behind that, 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 that speech, if you will, saying, I love you, if there's action behind it, then it's alive. How many of you guys want a marriage that's alive? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Oh. Mm. <laughs> I'm not convinced. How many of you guys want a marriage that is alive and on fire for God? Right? You want the world to see who Jesus if is. You single, your hands should still go if up. If you're single, you should be taking notes right now. Right? For that day when you 
say I do because you've got to get this down now. God wants to do something amazing in your marriage. Now, I want to preface with this. I said this last week. Missy and I, and I apologize if from time to time during messages on the platform, you catch me checking her out. It does. It does happen. It happens every Sunday. His mission of life is to humiliate me in public. So mission accomplished? Yes! I love it. So, I'm madly in love with this woman. I'm madly in love. But let me be very honest and very transparent with you, okay? In the beginning, it was a struggle. Not because of her. <laughs> but if you want to go that route, I guess you can. We can go into detail. We can go into detail. No, it, it was a struggle, right? The first year for any marriage can be hell. It can be. It can be really, really hard. And the thing is, if you're going through hell, don't stop. Keep on going. If you stop, you're going to end up staying there. You're going to live in it. So don't stay there. So, so what we did is we pushed through it. And we said, you know what? We got married for a reason. There's a reason why we fell in love. There's a reason why we spent all that money and, and, and took the whole day out to dedicate the rest of our lives. I don't know whose money it was, but there was some money spent, I'm telling you. It happened. And my biggest contribution to that day was I spent the day before power washing the sidewalks because that's the man thing to do. It was what? Okay, you know what? Let's just pause for a second. What? Even before our wedding, What's wrong? the war begins, right? I am inside with my mom and my sisters and whoever else is there. Doing a and great we are job. trying to get the inside of the sanctuary. Amazing. Awesome. Right? And I'm like, where is Brad? Because we had these pillars we were Taking trying to like cover with tools. I'm like, where is Brad and his dad? Get this place right? They're like, I think he's out back. I'm like, out back doing what? Like, we were in a sanctuary that was at our college, and they had just poured new sidewalks in the back, so it's still kind of like dirt and mud heaps, and nobody, nobody was going to the back, right? What? Nobody. What? So we're going to come in the front door, Are you to the way, and we're not going to The sidewalks went all the way around the building, but the big square. What's in the back. It's a campus. So I go I'm not just going to walk on the front sidewalk, and I'll walk around right. the building. So I go outside. And I'm like, I'm gonna find this dude, man. And I go out there, and what is he doing? But he has this There's power a nice washer shining armor in his hand. For a power washer. Yeah. 3,000 psi, yeah. baby. That's not what I thought. Blast off like, the dirt doing? and the mud and what the grime and the filth. He said, I'm power washing the sidewalks. I'm like, who cares? Why? I mean, who cares? Why? He's like, because I wanted to be clean. I'm like, are you kidding? Nobody's coming back here, right? It should have been a clue. So the next day, oh, wait, you we said, hold on. So I crawl up in the fetal, I crawl up in the fetal position on the sidewalk, suck my thumb, and I say, Are you about to marry a monster? She <laughs> You did it! I crawl back to my dorm. I'm like, what am I doing? <laughs> you know what the crazy thing is? Is whatever happens before the marriage, okay, this is this is a natural goal, right? <laughs> Magnify. After the marriage. After. Now, I was not nasty that day. Your father came right there. I was not. There's, there's not a word in human language for what you were that day. That's why, that's why it wasn't nasty. We don't know what it was, but it was not human. We know that. Whatever. You know what's amazing? Right, Zilla. When you are least expecting it, when you're tired. 
and when you're exhausted and when you feel like life is already chaotic enough, but yet you, you said I do and now you're in this thing called marriage. The Bible is really clear about what Jesus did for his bride. You see, the reason it's an example is the Bible says that Jesus is the groom and we the church are his bride. And he made it really clear in the word of God what he did for his bride. You know what he did? He laid down his life. He was willing, because of his love, to be the most selfless person who ever walked the face of the earth. And he said, he said, look here, I'm going to lay out for you the guise of how you love out loud. I'm going to give you some roles. God is all about order. And God says, I'm going to give you some roles. And as long as you work and operate within the roles I've given you, this can be the most beautiful thing. But if you decide to take it upon yourself to get the role out of line, and you decide to do things the way you want to do it rather than the way I want you to do it, you are going to be in the most miserable covenant you can ever imagine. Wait, what's a covenant? A covenant is a two-way promise. And here's what happens. It's not just a two-way between a husband and a wife, but it's between a husband and a wife and God. And I want you to know, if you go to Ephesians 5, and I'm not going to read all of this section just for a sake of time, but I want you to pull it up for me. And I'm going to highlight a couple things. Right out of the beginning of Ephesians 5, this is where Paul, the Apostle Paul, lays out what is the role of a husband and the role of a wife. And before he lays out the distinguished roles, he starts with this, and it says, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. That word submit means respect. So before he says, I'm going to tell you wives what your role is, and I'm going to tell you husbands what your role is, the first thing I'm going to say to both of you when you get married is this. Respect one another. Let me say something. We don't respect people because of who they are. Or because of the way they've treated us. We don't love people because of who they are or because of the way they've treated us. We love people and we respect people because of who we are and who Christ is in us. So he starts with this, then he goes on and he talks directly to the wives and he says this, he says, Wives, understand and support your husbands in a way that would show support for Christ. Let's just stop. You don't honor and respect your husband because of who they are. Or because of what they have done or what they've given you. You respect and you honor your husband to show your support for Christ. To honor God. It goes on, it says, The husband provides leadership to his wife the way Christ does for his church. Pause. If the husband is not providing leadership in the home, we have a problem. We have a problem. We're going to talk about that in just a second. It goes on to say this, Not by domineering, but by cherishing. So just as the church submits to Christ as he exercises such leadership, wives should likewise submit to their husbands. That word submit again means respect. And in this passage, it also means to come under the mission of your spouse. You see, when you get married and you come together, you are submitting yourself to God's authority on marriage. And God says, look, I'm the one who came up with the idea. It's my idea. I, it's my game. I get to make the rules. He said, I'm going to make the man the leader of the home. I'm going to put inside of him the desire to lead his family, to have a vision for his home. And I'm going to put within the wife a desire to come alongside and be a helpmate, to come alongside and help support the vision of that family. After we got married, and life started getting rough really, really fast in our home, okay? Because personalities come into play, right? You're me. What? <laughs> I mean, well, here's what happens. Your personalities come out, right? I happen to be... <laughs> she doesn't even like cats. She hates cats. <laughs> I'm a liar leader, which means if I walk into a room and things are like chaotic, I'm going to bring order really, really, really fast. Because that's just who I am. If I go into somebody else's zone and it's a mess, like I go to weddings, right? And things are chaotic. And Brad's like, this is not, this is not your day, man. You can't step up and help. You just have to sit down and watch it burn, right? You just, you just have to go, oh my goodness, I gotta help somebody. I like to bring order. But here's the deal. That, we had to learn that, guess what? I had to come under the mission of what Brad, what God had showed Brad.
dad, and Brad used to tell me this. He would say, hey, listen, I dream it, you do it. That's how this works. <laughs> what? See, this, this is where I would come in and deny it and make some jokes. It's true. It's true. I, it's true. And at Sorry. first it was like, Sorry. But, it, like, but it, that, is, that is the arrangement. It's working well. Because Brad was always the dreamer. And I was like, let's just go get it done. And it took a few months, a few years, and we were doing ministry from day one. We were worship pastors before we were married, and we were kids pastors and youth pastors and always doing ministry and always working full-time jobs. And all of a sudden, man, it turned out to be very much fun. And I was like, stop dreaming! Run and stop doing! Right? This ain't working that out! Wasn't the deal. <laughs> but if you want it to work, you both have to know your roles. What's yeah. the husband's role? It's so, actually much harder it is. than the wife's but role. You know what's really cool about what you were saying is when you look at, when you're talking about the husband being the head of the home, it's, it's a perfect picture of who Christ is in the church. He is the head of the church. Look at 1 Corinthians and look at how he, the Bible talks about the body of Christ and everybody has their place and Jesus is the head of the church. And it's Christ's vision that compels us and drives us each and every day. And the church is the bride of Christ, right? And so I'm supposed to exemplify the leadership just as Jesus exemplifies his leadership to the church. I'm supposed to exemplify that love and that sacrifice and that leadership to her as she is a picture of the church. Isn't that awesome? That's really huge. So, so when, you, when you think about the role of the husband to, to, to love his wife as Christ loves the church, you have to ask yourself, how did Christ love out loud for the church? What did he do? He gave his life for the church. I mean, I mean, let's really get this and let's get it good. He gave himself willingly to die on a cross for us. What's, what, what is it? Romans? Romans? Huh? Five and eight, sure. That he willingly gave himself for us while we were yet sinners. While we were enemies of God. While we were in contempt. While we were literally just guilty as all get out, he gave himself as the ultimate sacrifice so pause right for the there. church. So he didn't wait until we had our act together no. to love us. He didn't wait until we expressed to him how much we loved him and we, that we were going to do everything right. We were going to honor him and follow his vision. So he didn't point out all of our faults and tell us what we needed to get right in order to receive the love he that he had. He didn't say, I'll right. change when you change. He didn't say, you know what? I'm going to love you the way that you are. With he he looked at he looked at all of humanity and said, you don't deserve my love. But guess what? Somebody has to step up and lead so, in this picture. Somebody has to be willing to take the first step in this loving out loud. And Jesus said, I'm willing to go to the cross. And I want to just throw a plug. It's not timeless, but it's timely this week. That is, there's a new movie out called Risen. If you haven't gone and seen it, I encourage you to go to the theater yeah, and put out the money to go and support a Christian movie in our local theaters. It's playing in Grove, but it's called Risen, and it's all about what we're talking about. It's about the love that Jesus Christ overflowed into our world when he laid down his life. So when we look at what Christ did, it was an unconditional expression of his love for the church. What would marriages in America look like yeah. if the only thing that happened was men just love their wives unconditionally? How many marriages would be saved? Just if men did their part. Because what would begin to happen is because women, the way that God has wired women, is if men would naturally just love their wives, women would then want to come alongside their man. And come under the mission. It would come, they would come under the mission. I want you to look next at Ephesians 4. We're going to look really quickly at this passage. Ephesians 4 and 2 and 3, and it says this. Always, this is a picture of how we love out loud in our relationships, okay? Always be humble and gentle. Wait, that means not full of pride? Pushy? Be patient with each other. Do you know patience in marriage would go a long way? Because guess what? You marry, you marry somebody and you marry everything about them. You marry all their junk and all their baggage and sometimes, you know, second marriage is you marry their children like they came into that home and all of a sudden their family, the in-laws, you need a lot of patience. Ooh. You need a lot of patience. The Bible says in James 1 and 19, I have great in-laws for the record. You do. James 1 and 19 says this. I'm not going to say that. I've got great in-laws. My mama watches. I know, I am on. What's up? I James 1 and 19 says this. 
listen. I want to tell you one thing that saved our marriage, and I'm not kidding, okay? We were three years in, and we had four kids in three years. We had four kids in two and a half years. So at three years in, the twins weren't here yet. That's stupid. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't insane. We didn't it plan it. We did not, not plan it. We were trying not to right, have bad plan. But listen to me. The one scripture that I started playing over in my mind, over and over and over and over and over again. I knew my role, okay? I knew my role. My mouth was my problem, okay? <laughs> I'm not kidding. So this is what I would tell myself. Some of you guys are like, yep. There you go. Hold it tight. I would tell myself, be slow to speak and quick to listen. If he says something, there has to be a reason. Because the Bible says that in the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Because what begins to happen in a relationship is they begin to point out faults. And whether they're the right attitude or not, and a lot of times we were not, and that's why we were struggling. But he might say something, and I was like, that is not true. Like, I do have control of my mouth. I don't know what your problem is. You're the one with the problem, right? Yeah, that's what happened. And... <laughs> just like that. It's that close. And you know what I begin to say to myself? We can, you know, this is funny, because we're running out of time to Christ. That was good. That was good. But I started saying to myself, God help me to be slow to speak and quick to listen. And when I began to do that, I began to hear with my heart what he was saying with his mouth. And I began to say, God, that's not the kind of wife I want to be. That's not what I dreamed of being. God help me. And the more I would do that, the easier it became to be really slow. Be really, really slow to speak. Go back to Ephesians chapter 2, chapter 4, and verse 2. It says this, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Making allowance for each other's faults. If you're perfect in this room, go ahead and throw your hand up real fast. Yeah, wrong. <laughs> Not one of us are perfect. Jesus was the only one who was perfect, and he laid down his life. If we want to make our marriages work, we have to make allowance for each other's faults because we're human. And what begins to happen in a relationship is that couple, you have to be quick to listen and quick to say, I'm sorry. Two of the hardest words that ever come out of a person's mouth is to say, I'm sorry, and really, really mean it. Because if you say, I'm sorry, and you do it again, were you really very sorry? If you say I'm sorry, and you say I'm sorry, and you say I'm sorry for the same thing over and over, people begin to think there's really no action behind your words. But you know what? If we will allow for one another to have faults and to realize, you know what? We together are growing in this thing. Together we're going to make this thing called life works. Together we're going to be a marriage that is going to get exemplify the gospel message to the world. You know, about three years in, Brad and I, had we, made, we did one thing right from day one. One thing. Not too many, but one. We made a covenant that we would not say the word divorce in our home. It was as bad as any bad word you know. And we, we made a covenant. We got married and we got married for life for life. And there were times where it would almost come out of our mouths. And then we would stop. Because we would really think, is that really? Like if it comes out of your mouth, then you're honestly going to question, is that a possibility? And in our minds, we had to tell ourselves, this is not a possibility. And if you're in a second or a third marriage, I want you to know that God has got a second and third chances. But whoever you're married to right now, I want you to make up your mind that the D word doesn't get said in your home from this point forward. Because the enemy is out to utterly and totally destroy you. And you don't have to allow it. The fight's not against one another. You can come together. It's just a couple practical points, okay? We, we can teach an entire conference on marriage and we have very little time. But I want you to know, two things you got to do with your spouse every single day. Have to. You have to pray together. If you're not praying together with your spouse, I'm telling you right now, you are wide open. Wide open for destruction. Well, I mean, that's embarrassing. Really? Do you want me to go there? We have kids in the room, okay? There's things way more embarrassing that you see in 
your homes, okay? Praying together is just talking. It's just talking to God. You grab the hand of your spouse, and let's be honest, men, Brad, whose job is it? It's mine. It's a man. But if men, if you're not willing, then woman, step up. But man, it's your job. Grab the hand of your spouse and say a little prayer. God be with us today. Help us. Guide us. Give us wisdom. Whatever you need. Pray together every single day. And open your word together. You know what? If all you do is read one scripture, just one. You can read way more, but if you just read one together and start trying to apply it together as a family, what you're doing is you're building your defense against the enemy. You're building that wall for war because he's going to come after you and you have to know that. But you've got to realize that together you're stronger. If you're trying to go, and I, I read the scripture to you last week in Amos chapter 2, but two people can't go in two different directions and be successful. And in too many homes, what's happening is you've done this so long, one's on that side of the house and one's on this side. But what your children are seeing is a home divided right before their eyes. The Bible says very clearly that a house divided will not stand. And yet your marriage is the greatest example of the gospel message that the world will ever see. And let me say, aside from that, having an awesome marriage is the greatest thing you will ever experience in your life. And I would dare to say that we live in a world where less than 90%, no, backwards, less than 10% are probably really experiencing an incredible marriage like we're talking about. Stand up with us today, if you would, please. You know, when, when Misty and I realized that we had to just both have that, that, that mutual commitment and drive to act like Christ, that's when it changed. When we took Paul's advice, it says, to die daily. Every day we committed to pick up the cross and follow after Jesus together. And we stopped worrying about what I want right. and started worrying about what our spouse wants. It's about being selfless. And when, when I realized that this marriage, is, it has nothing to do with me at all, and it was all about her, I began serving her and loving her, I realized that it's just about her. And she realized that it's just about me. And you're saying to yourself, well, you guys had a mutual understanding, and that's why it worked. You're right. Because it takes two to make a marriage unbelievable. So you might be saying to yourself, but I don't have that. I want to do what's right. I want to live right, but my spouse is not on board. Don't give up. Your job is to love him. Your job is to love her. It's not conditional. Don't give up. Keep on loving him. Keep on praying him. In 15 seconds, tell Tell what happened to, to Jesse Law. Now, a girl that started with us in the beginning of the church, her name was Jesse Law. And Jesse, her husband, didn't serve God. And Jesse, many, many times, wanted to give up and she wanted to just leave. And she would take anointing oil. And anointing oil is nothing more than a representation of the Holy Spirit, okay? That's all it is. But she would take anointing oil and she would pray over her husband's pillow and he had no idea. She would anoint his pillow. She would pray over his pillow, and we would tell her, we're like, we're leaving with you. We would sometimes pray together, and she would take something and slip it in his pillow. She prayed for years, guys. Years. 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 God moved them from Grove, Oklahoma to Alva, Oklahoma for a job that he had there. And when he got there, she continued to pray and continued to pray, and it was about a year in. That one day we got a call from her and she said Jeremy gave his life to Christ. And what she didn't know, well she knew Jeremy had an alcohol problem, but she didn't know Jeremy had a drug addiction as well. But what began to happen is God completely flipped Jeremy's life all the way around. And I'm not telling you that it was easy. I never walked in her shoes, okay? But I'm telling you, I've watched it be possible. She never gave up. And she never gave prayed. up. And she prayed. Never. And she prayed. And I would encourage you to go get War Room. And watch War Room. And watch a woman who prayed and never, ever gave up. When you will pray for your spouse, if you'll stop focusing on their faults and start praying.
praying for them. And start focusing on your own faults, because you've got them too. Work on you and pray for them. God will do an amazing work in your marriage. I want to encourage you guys today. We're going to pray with you, but I want to tell you, I'm, I'm so excited this morning because God can do this in your marriage. It's never too late. God can do this in your marriage. How many of you guys want to win in your marriage? Yes? Right? Quitters never win. Winners never quit. God has not called you to give up. He's not called you to quit. Never, ever, ever, ever quit. Let's bow our heads. Father, we are grateful today for your amazing presence and, and your word and the picture that you've shown us on marriage. I, I pray, God, over every couple in this place, every single person that will be married one day, I pray, God, that you would begin to do something supernatural in every single one of these couples, Father God, with single people believing for a marvelous marriage. I pray that you would do something inside of our hearts that would cause us to love out loud. Help us to see who Christ is and what He did on the cross and what that means to us as we pick up our cross and follow after You daily, Father God. Help us to be selfless in our marriages. Help us to be more concerned about serving the other than to be self-serving. God, I pray that You would give us this, this unquenchable drive and this passion to just love them. this work. God, if there's mountains in anyone's life this morning that's keeping them from an unbelievable marriage, I pray that those mountains would be moved. I pray that you would reveal what those mountains are to each and every individual and that you would start doing something incredible in the marriages of Mountain Movers Church. And like your word says, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden at night. So, Father, let it be the same for us. That marriages from this church, Father God, would be as a city set on a hill across the countrysides of this community and the outer edges of this region, Father God, that people would see our marriages and it would be an evidence of the existence of Almighty God. That they would see these marriages and they would recognize quickly that God is real and Jesus is alive. Let us be a living gospel track, Father God, for the glory of God, for the kingdom of God, to be an impact on this world and the world around us, Father God. Use us. Flow through us, God. Let your love be poured out through that funnel. And let us pour out your love, Father God, to our spouses. And let the world sit back and be amazed. Let them stand back and watch us burn in flames. Because we are madly, madly in love with a fiery hot marriage for one another and for you, O oh God. God, do this right now. Do this right now for every couple in this place, Father. With heads bowed and eyes closed, I want to give an opportunity right now for those of you in this place that would say, Pastor, I want to know Jesus as my Savior. I want to know that heaven can be my home. I want to make that official today. You've heard us talking about uh, the wonderful things of God all throughout this Word. And you might say to yourself, I want what He's talking about. I'm going to give you that opportunity right now. This is what it means for you. It means that you would just admit that you've fallen short in sin, as we all have. You're not perfect. It's about asking God to forgive you of those sins and ask Him to wipe your heart clean and believe that He truly is the Son of God and confessing Him as Lord of your life and dedicating that you're going to live for God according to His Word. If you want to make that decision today, this moment right here and right now is the essence of why we started this church. To lead you, whoever you are, into a real and life-changing relationship with Jesus that is contagious. That you would run with Jesus throughout your life and that His love would be poured out onto people in your surroundings and that they would realize how real He is through your life. But there's mountains that have to be moved. And the number one mountain that hits us all is sin. Today, that mountain can be moved. 
by asking God to forgive you those sins. And you can start making the first step towards really knowing what it's like to have an unbelievable life. You want to discover life, this is what it's all about. I'm going to count to three, and when I do, I'm going to count to three. If this is you today, if you want to make this decision, I want you to raise your hand nice and high so I can see where you're at. I can pray with you. We're going to pray with you as a family this morning. We're going to agree with you as you give your life to Christ. So here we go. One, two, three. May I see your hand today? And I'm speaking to those of you that are watching online as well. Amen. Anybody else today? Anybody else you want to say, Pastor Brad, I'm giving my life to Christ. I'm giving my life to Jesus today. May I see your hand in the back, buddy? Anybody else? Amen. So here's how we do. We're going to pray together as a family. Just want you to repeat after me. Say, Father, I love you. I know that I've sinned and fallen short. I ask that you would forgive me. Cleanse my heart. Make me new. I believe that Jesus is who he says he is. I confess with my mouth that he is Lord. I dedicate from this moment forward that I will live for you, O oh God. According to your word, surround me with godly people. Make your house my home. In Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. Give God praise this morning for those who have come to Christ. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us today. If you want to be a part of something bigger than yourself, give to our ministry. We've made giving easy here at Mountain Movers Church. If you have your smartphone, just text the number 918 223 8090. Just push in the amount you want to give and push send. It's that easy. If you don't have your smartphone, not a problem. You can mail your giving just as easy to 24,000 South 660 Road, Grove, Oklahoma 74344. Thanks for watching today. Hey, remember, we're dreaming big for you. We'll see you next week.